Okay, so um, a couple things start off. This is the Bible Connection podcast, okay? And for um, the viewers that are watching, um, we are kind of under construction right now. So this is new. Um, so we'll kind of be building and practicing this podcast and making it better um, as we go along. But to, to kind of start off, a uh, couple goals for the podcast are we are seeking to encourage um, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to um, be in the Word. Um, two, this is kind of like a resource um, to help us get through Scripture, specifically with our Bible reading plan. And then um, the third goal is learning how to discern and um, kind of tie the narrative of Scripture together. Um, so with that, um, first week, Genesis 1 through 24, correct? 1 through 24? Yes. Okay. Uh, and we'll just kind of get started into it. Um, so the first question is, uh, what is the overall theme or message of Genesis? And I'll just go ahead and let you start, and we'll just pick up. Okay, I'll, I'll try to make this simple. But um, God, through covenant, uh, is redeeming a lost order that was established in Genesis 1. Uh, God created the heaven and the earth, and everything was good, um, and everything was in perfect order. Sin entered the world and caused a... Uh, chaos to that order and a growing chaos as we read through uh, Genesis 3 through 11. Um, and then God finds a man, Abraham, and um, is redeeming that order through covenant and a promise uh, to redeem the order um, that was lost. Yeah, and, and, and that's, <clears throat> I think that's fantastic to say. And, and through how God is, is, is redeeming, um, unfolds as as the scriptures unfold themselves and there um there we we as 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 we've gathered together and, and and decided to do this we want to see we want to show people that there is you know yes the bible is made up of 66 books but there is one storyline there's one meta narrative there's one this 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 grand um um story that's 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 there. That's that's weaved throughout the text, and within this story, there's multiple themes. And in in Genesis, the Genesis begins in in the garden, and that garden imagery um, um, plays out in the temple. The temple in 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 First Kings um, uh, picks up on this garden imagery, um, as 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 Taylor was saying that the world has has you know the God is is redeeming the world. Um, and but he he the 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 world has fallen into into chaos into sin, and God is not giving up on 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 his creation on his people, and he's redeeming um, his people. And in that storyline, we see that that this garden imagery. Yes, garden and Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden, but that doesn't mean that God is done with them because we we see later. Um, that after after the garden, um, that that there's there's um, there's uh, an, another another rescue a rescue um, through through the um, through the ark and the ark is is if you look if you read the the text carefully the ark is is like a, a small garden Eden yeah. it's like it's like another Eden and, mm -hmm. and what's interesting is is with you know um, God's commission to Adam and Eve you know be fruitful multiply um, and that's kind of the f feminine um, part of that, and then the masculine of subdue and, and take dominion. You know, he tells that to Adam, right? Mm -hmm. To 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 the uh, to to the Adam, right? And then in in Noah, as Noah comes off of off of the ark, you know, we see that 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 Noah is is another Adam, right? Mm -hmm. He he is he's we even we even learn that he he finds himself in a garden. Right, and he's given the same, basically the same commission that God gives to Adam: be fruitful, multiply, take dominion, subdue the earth. Right, that same thing, and then that storyline plays out from Genesis all the way through the Tanakh, even into the New Testament. The, to, the Tanakh being the, the the Torah, the Nevi'im, then the Ketuvim, the what we call the Old Testament, um, and then also there's multiple themes. Um, you know, you have garden and the imagery uh, um, uh, after. You have garden, um, ark, and then 
the the tabernacle climaxing in the temple because in the temple or in the tabernacle imagery, especially in First Kings, that the 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 temple is if you look there's the, the text says that that there's um, um, carvings of pomegranates, open flowers. Um, it looks like a garden, right? So the, the 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 tabernacle is like a traveling garden, right? And that that theme carries on in, into the New Testament, but also a big one is the seed serpent theme that we find um, early in in the text that that from Genesis three fifteen that there's going to be you know this one that's going to crush the serpent's head and the serpent's going to crush his heel. You know, you, you see that that play out in Canaan. Um, um, there's 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 another curse there, just like just like with the serpent. But also a, a big one right in the middle of the text is David, David and Goliath. We think about you know we, we talk about that text a lot, but we don't see that that, that text is picking up on this serpent seed theme. That that David being the seed or the the, the seed of the woman crushing. The serpent's head, and you're thinking, well, wait a minute, you said Goliath, not a serpent. Well, if you look at the text, Goliath is 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 pictured as wearing chain mail, and what he's saying almost sounds like a hiss, right? And and, and but after David kills Goliath, what does he do? He he cuts off his head. Well, that's why does he do that? He's already killed him. Mm-hmm. But not only that, what does he do with his head? He takes his head to Jerusalem. Okay. Where he takes his head to to Jerusalem, that's kind of strange. Why would you do that? Because he's making him ceremonially unclean, right? You're not supposed to do that. But it, this it it just seems strange. And then we find that Jesus, you know, th- this this storyline climaxing in Jesus, right? Where is Jesus crucified? The place of the skull. This is where Goliath's head is taken. Right? So you see this serpent seat, and there's many, many, many other themes that are that are there, and that's just we're, that's just a few that are there. So I went over my time, John. Sorry. I don't know if you have a set amount of time, but if you're going to ask like what's the theme of Genesis, it's kind of a difficult question. I mean, you just heard um, two different fantastic perspectives that are both rich and fulfilling for Christians to hear about the the redemption of of the chaotic order of of, of, of the world, and and then you have. Um, the theme of temples and the theme of Christ um, fulfilling the the, the the prophecy of the seed that will crush the head of the serpent. And I, I think what's really important to look at when you're looking at the theme of Genesis is how how Christ would interpret Genesis. And mm. so, like, if you look at after his resurrection, he, he meets two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And in speaking to them, it says in Luke 24, 27, Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so I think that if we read Genesis and we're just looking at it as an isolated, you know, this was 3,400 years ago, um, you know, historical document, we're going to miss the rich fulfillment that we have in Christ Jesus when we, when we look at the scriptures and how they testify to him. And so when you read Genesis, when you're going through your reading plan and you're looking at the narrative, you're looking at the story, that's what, what we mean by narrative. Or you're looking at themes, whether you're looking at a covenant or a garden or a flood. Um, I want to make sure that what you're trying to do is you're trying to read this, yes, what did Moses mean to his original audience? We don't want to allegorize things out of thin air, Mm -hmm. but we want to read it as Jesus would read it. We want to read it as Paul would read it, as the New Testament authors read it. They knew their Bibles. And so if you were to ask me, what is the theme of Genesis? Um, what I see is this growing trend from Genesis chapter 1, how we're called to um, to be image bearers of God, that we are made in his image and after his likeness, and that develops throughout Scripture, that there's more and more clarity, more revealed to us through the prophets over, over time, many times in many ways, until the Son has come and spoken and revealed himself. Um, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. And so... The theme of Genesis is a theme of um, God's people bearing his image, faltering in their sin, but being redeemed by the promise of the seed, being promised the promise of this one who crushed the head of the serpent. We see many men try to fill that image and fail, and we see God's intervention with the man Abraham who will bring about the lineage that will bring us to the, to the person of Jesus. So coattailing off of Abraham, um, one of the questions we come up with was, if you could highlight anything in Genesis as you read chapters 1 through 24 specifically, because that's the week, first week in January is what our reading is. Um, 
what would you say is uh, something that you would highlight for others to think more deeply about? Uh, or what would you have them reread or focus on? Um, I'd like to jump in. <clears throat> uh, so w- we have Genesis divided into 50 chapters. And those were added much later by a rabbi in like 1200 AD. But anyways, we have 50 chapters and 11 of them cover thousands of years of history. Whereas the next 39 really only covered four generations, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So from uh, like the audience perspective, um, when we look at Genesis, we, we recognize that the meat of what was recorded um, is in those generations. And then um, when we look at Genesis 1 through 11, and I meant to mention this earlier, uh, but there's um, almost a meta narrative in the dialogue between order and chaos that is being told uh, to their audience. Uh, the, the Israelites were an ancient Near Eastern audience, and they were very familiar with order and chaos, uh, especially coming out of Egypt, too. Um, and what they see is order established in Genesis 1. Um, as we read in Genesis uh, 1, verse 2, uh, tohu vevohu, there's, there's chaos and void, and there's nothing there. And God takes that chaos and voidness um, and creates order out of it. Um, but just two chapters later, we see in Genesis 3 uh, where sin has entered the picture. And from Genesis 3 to 4 to 5, to, to from Cain and Abel to, uh, to the generations of Noah and the flood to the Tower of Babel, all the way to 11, what we see is this increasing um, amount of chaos on the earth in sin to the fact and the fact that we see um, that God looked at the hearts of man and continually from their youth, they were sinful. Um, they wanted nothing to do with God. So we see this growing kingdom of sin and chaos that has uh, a heart that wants nothing to do with God. So God reaches out um, and creates this redemptive plan through covenant. And I forgot what your original question was. <laughs> but if, if there was something in Genesis that you'd want to highlight. I, I want to highlight. Specifically 1 through 24. Yeah, 1 through 24. Our, our there was order created, Genesis 1. Chaos came into the picture, ruined that order, that perfect uh, relationship in which uh, man trusted God in all things and and sought to live for him. Um, And then we see, uh, so the order is is, is completely out of whack um, in this chaos, but God redeems it. And he redeems it through uh, making a covenant uh, with a man named Abraham who, who, who doesn't deserve anything. He's a, he's a pagan worshiping guy, comes in and makes a covenant with him um, um, that him and his generations, if they follow the Lord, um, that he would uh, redeem and once again the, the, the be fruitful and multiply and subduing the earth and fulfilling the earth uh, would be carried through uh, that lineage and in that same, um, you could say, order that was established in Genesis 1 could be recreated uh, through that redemptive plan. So um, we see so much of the rest of the dialogue with Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, um, and into the people uh, with Joseph in Egypt, um, that that redemptive plan is becoming increasing and, and more known uh, to his people. Um, and the order that was lost is being regained back. Yeah. And I, 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 I like what you're saying there, that, that he's, yes, he is, he is bringing... Um, he is he is he is subduing chaos and putting it into. I, 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 I'm trying to use the biblical. I, I, I like what you're saying. But what's interesting though, how he's doing that? He's doing that just like Paul says. You know, the the wisdom of the world is foolishness, right? You know, but he how God brings order from chaos sometimes looks so strange to us. Like for instance, how how God is doing that? You know, which of which of which of Adam and Eve's sons is is does does the blessing come through well well you know in in, in our you know in, in our top thing well it would be the first what's well, not you know and, you know you know Cain kills Abel right and then from from then on you know we, we you, you would think that the that the blessing would come through you know I think it's called the rite of progenitor or something but you know you you get to um, Jacob and Esau right which one's born first? Well, that's not the one, you know. You know, he God God chooses Jacob, right? Ishmael and Isaac, you know, exactly, right? You know, 
and God, God, what you would think, what we would think, God, how how God would bring um, order from chaos looks looks quite different. He's and, and and I think God is 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 doing this. He's using his electing, you know, his 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 you know his sovereignty. You know, he is he's he's doing this in in sometimes the strangest of ways, especially through a guy like Jacob. Right? I mean, you read about Jacob. You know, and it's like, wait a minute, God, you you decided to use this guy? Like, why? You know, but um, you see, he's he's choosing um, um, Jacob and not Esau. He's he's choosing Judah and not the and what is Reuben the firstborn? Right? You know, Re- Reuben's the firstborn, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. We should have talked about that one before, but yes, uh, he's the firstborn. Yeah, but you know. God is, is 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 the seed is coming through the strangest of ways, and, and I know we talked about this before, and hopefully we'll get to get into it. But how He brings the blessing through Judah is like, well, wait a minute, that that doesn't sound right. It's extremely strange. Yeah, it's almost it's provocative. You know what I'm saying? It's the well, the, the 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 narrative as as you're reading, you're like, oh my goodness, like it's it's it doesn't sound right. But that's how God does it. You know, and and God is is doing some amazing amazing things here in in the narrative. But I'm I'm jumping ahead. So, so I want to jump one thing real quick before you go on. You're good, you're Ten good. seconds. Um, but to be in covenant is to be in relationship, um, and God chooses covenants of that day and age because specifically they required you to be in relationship with both parties. God just doesn't want this list of orders of for you to do in order to, to fulfill his needs, but rather he wants a relationship with you. So he picks uh, the specific uh, understanding of a covenant in that day to communicate that relationship. Yeah, definitely. Um, when I'm looking at what I would highlight for you to, to think about if you're reading through your Bible reading plan and looking at Genesis, I'm probably one of the weirdest people in the world. I would say look at the generations, look at the genealogies, yeah. like the stuff that you would normally want to skip you know, they're just, what's these numbers? What are these names? And the reason for that is because if you if you look into these generations, they're really structuring the text of Genesis to help guide you into reading these covenantal relationships with these figures. So you have in Genesis chapter 2, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth. And you see um, Adam and Eve and how they basically bring about the fall on the heavens and the earth. And then when you get into chapter 5, you have these are the generations of Adam. But you don't hear much about Adam. Instead, you're hearing about his progeny, about his son, because the focus of Genesis has shifted to this promised person who will crush the head of the serpent. Everyone is anticipating and longing for this progeny, this offspring. That Are they going to come? And it almost reads very dramatically. Moses is, is writing in a way that builds a lot of suspense in a lot of these stories. You know, Cain slaughters his brother Abel, and it's, it's this, this son Seth that finally in his day— People begin to call on the name of the Lord. And then you get some more genealogies. These are the generations of Seth. And you get the, the table of nations that brings you down um, to Noah. And Noah, is this going to be the, the man that is going to crush the head of the serpent? But just like Adam, he um, comes off of the ark and he finds himself naked and ashamed in a garden with wine, shamefully naked in front of his children, bringing about another curse on his descendants. And so you get into... All of these genealogies, and when you get to Abraham, this relationship that God strikes with him when he cuts a covenant and he and he and he makes this promise to Abraham that through that he, through him the whole world will be blessed and that, that his his children will be as numerous as the stars. You're starting to see God is specifically revealing that through this man that that the offspring is going to come and he's going to keep his promise in creation. So don't skip the genealogies. Um, the genealogies are the literary structure that divide Genesis. You can see. Chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 10, chapter 11, 25, 36. These are the generations of so-and-so, and and you see how God is fulfilling that promise and how the text is organized by those those headings. Okay, I'm I'm just going to— So many things. Yeah. So So just jumping in here, um, you know, previous things we mentioned, like, for instance— we are made in God's image, right? And we're supposed to be image bearers of God. So um, one, of, one of the questions I had was we see like in New Testament, I believe churches across, you know, our nation, they always preach be imitators of Christ. 
right? So where can we take that idea, um, you know, as New Covenant, New Testament believers, like how do we take the book of Genesis and apply it to our life, maybe specifically as being image bearers or just in general? The first thought that comes to my mind is finding joy in God. So I was thinking about the passage of Abraham and Sarah. Abraham uh, is before the Lord, um, and um, he, he sees three men, and he, as an old man, shames himself and just runs to the Lord. Um, and old men in that culture did not uh, run. It was just it was shameful. But he did that because he— Especially men that are as good as dead, as the author of Hebrews says. He's so old. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good as dead. Um, but he, he shamed himself before the Lord because he just loved the Lord so much. And in that passage, it has, uh, he says something I've written down here. Quick, three seas of fine flour, knead it, and make cakes, uh, speaking to Sarah. Um, it basically take all that they have in the, in, in the New Testament. Um, when Jesus is referring to it, um, he actually says— or it, the NIV actually, not that it's my favorite translation, but the NIV, NIV translate it as 60 pounds of flour. So um, Jesus says in Matthew uh, chapter 13, the kingdom of heaven is like, um, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Referring back to Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 18, they took the finest and the best and all they did, and just for the few they had, they made this huge coarse meal out of their joy. And so Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this, having joy before the Lord. So um, once again, because my, my thoughts are really short, I forget your question, Josh. But if I had to well, – can you remind me with the question? So as like a new covenant, New Testament believer, right? As a the, new covenant, I think sometimes we get we get lost in being obedient to the Lord, but forget that the most important thing out of everything is loving the Lord uh, in your joy and just finding uh, yourself most satisfied in the Lord in all things that you do. Um, and we see that early on in Genesis, right here with Abraham and Sarah as an example. Um, but Abraham leaves everything he knows. Yeah. He leaves everything he knows to follow this. This who's this God? Did you, who, who is this? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, at least his descendants get to hear the God of Abraham. He's right, like, <laughs> right. You know, you, you know, you just imagine, you know, you know, us telling our families, you know, there's this, there's this guy. He's called me to go to this other, this faraway place that I've never been to. And I don't know where we're going yet. He's going to show it to me when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, if I was going to emphasize something that we could do to imitate Christ or bear God's image, um, I would also point to Abraham, but specifically with his interactions with his nephew Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. And um, don't worry, I'm not going to get into the thick of it with Sodom and Gomorrah and, and that dreadful, detestable passage that we could find, that interaction with the angels. What I'm going to talk about here is a Abraham and Lot begin to have a disagreement over their possessions. And um, he says to Lot, you, know, you choose whether the left or the right, where are you going to go? And Lot lifted up his eyes, and he saw um, the, the worldly in enticement of Sodom and Gomorrah and without a thought to... The corruption of the city, and he immediately went down to it. But when Abraham goes and rescues him from um, from these wicked nations that have kidnapped the the people from Sodom and Gomorrah and and taken their possessions, and and the king of Sodom comes up to Abraham wanting to reward him, he says, "I'm not going to take a sandal strap." And the reason for this is because he knows that the Lord has promised to bless him, and he says, "Lest they say Sodom, the king of Sodom, has made me great." And so. I would encourage any believer um, in the Lord Jesus to, to think about when you're making decisions in life, you know, sometimes um, living a worldly life, a life that will distract you from reading the word, a life that will distract you from loving your wife, a life that will distract you from making disciples isn't a, isn't a, a blatant sin. You know, he, he had been offered this present from the king of Sodom, but we should not compromise um, on, on where we know our blessings come from. And we should, we should wholly depend on, on God for, for good things. I'm interested in this, um, at what you were talking about lot choosing, uh, in, in, when Abraham and lot separate in, in chapter 13, verse 10, he says, and lot lifted up his eyes when he's choosing the place he's to go after the, when they're separating, um, it says, and lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered, um, was well watered everywhere. Like the garden of God, the garden of God. How many times in life, this is the inverse of, you know, how do we, how do we, you know, be imitators of Christ, you know, and, and this is kind of the, the devil's advocate of that, you know, 
in, in times when we're, when we're at our worst, you know, we are justifying what we want by saying, oh, well, this, you know, this, you know, I'm, I'm going to buy this because this is like the garden of God, you know, you know, and, and I'm maybe totally misreading this text here, but it seems that in, in the flow of the narrative, in the flow of the narrative, um, this, this place is judged. I think that's the original temptation towards sin. If you look yeah. at, if you look at how the, the serpent was tempting man, tempting Eve, but man was there with him. So let's just say mankind was tempted by the serpent. He, he says, oh no, you won't die. You'll be like God. We'll go back to Genesis one twenty six. Let us make man after our image, after our likeness. They're already like God in the way that God designs, bearing his image like priest kings throughout creation. But what they want is not to be like God. They want to be God. They want to they obfuscate his position in creation. And so when Lot looks up and sees Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden, it's not like the garden in that he sees his ability to work and keep this garden like, like man was called to do and, and glorify God and spread his glory. He sees the bounty of the garden. He sees, he sees the, the, the satisfaction. In, the fruit was pleasing to his eyes. At, at least if I'm not reading too much into the text, that's what I see. Yeah. I, I love how, well, I won't, I won't get into that because um, we're kind of— I think we're running out of time. Yeah. We're running out of time, yeah. So I have one more question. We're testing our, our listeners' patience. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have one more question. All three of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> Hi, Mom. Uh, <laughs> so last question. Um, one of our goals is to kind of show people and then come together and figure out how to tie— uh, you mentioned the narrative of Scripture, how we tie books, passages— together through this whole narrative. Um, so the question is, um, how, does, how, how important or how does the book of Genesis tie the narrative in? And then going forward, what, what uh, are some things we need to be looking into when going through this Bible plan on how we can be thinking about the canon narrative yeah. of all of Scripture? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned canon because um, this was uh, when we were talking about the, the Toledot, these, which, which is the Hebrew... Um, the, and these are the generations of, right? And that, that is how Genesis, you know, we shouldn't originally think about Genesis dividing like Taylor so eloquently said. You know, we shouldn't think about Genesis as dividing into 50 chapters, but in two, into you know, sections divided by the Toledotes, the, mm-hmm. the, geneal- the genealogies. What's well, not just Genesis. Genesis is setting us up for how we should read the rest of the rest of the canon the, the the New Testament and the Old Testament and the New Testament, because you think about how the canon was originally. If you, if you if you were to go to a store right now and buy a modern a modern Hebrew text, a biblical Stuttgart Tertia, um, if you look at the last book that would be in that canon in that book, it would not be Malachi. It would be it would be Second Chronicles, mm-hmm. and Chronicles we know obviously is is originally was not divided genealogy. Right. So how does how does how does Chronicles begins? It begins with what eight nine chapters of genealogies, and you think, well, that's strange. Why does why does it why does it why is there all of these genealogies? You know, and then you think about well, how does Matthew begin? How does our New Testament canon begin? It begins with genealogy. Mm. You look at what is the center? What is the center of Chronicles genealogy? It's David. You know, you see, David is the structure. It's the foundation of the of the Chronicles genealogy is this the promise, the, the Davidic covenant from Second Samuel seven that there's always going to be, there's always going to be a, a David odd, right, or a, or a son of David on the throne ruling and reigning, right, and and the, and you get to Chronicles, and the the great irony is, is that it looks like it looks like everything has fallen apart. What you know. Chronicles. If if you if you were to sit down and read First and Second Chronicles, it's it's pretty depressing and it's supposed to be like that because the the, the canon, the, the the Old Testament canon ends with this. There's this great promise. God has has there's all of God's promises. You know, Paul says are yes and amen, but yet, God, where is the, where is the fulfillment of this promise? We're waiting. Where is this? Where is this 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 son of David that is to be the king? We should see ultimately the king of all the nations, the king of the world, right? And then in steps in in Matthew's gospel, the 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 Matthew genealogies with with David right there, 
showing that the point that, that, that Matthew self consciously is saying, okay, the answer to what you're looking for is Jesus. Jesus is Jesus is the new David that's to come that is going to take the rightful. He's going to be the king of Israel, right? So, anything from you guys? I mean, I would kind of just you know take your question and and twist around so I can get to where I want to where I want to <laughs> close, and which is like if. Why should you read the Old Testament? You know, like what is Genesis doing? What's it establishing as a, you know for covenants for the meta narrative? That that's I love those questions. But like you're reading your Bible reading plan, why should you read the book of Genesis? And I would take you again to the New Testament and look at how they talked about it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we find a passage we're very familiar with. Um, but it, you know, Timothy is being told to continue in what he learned and has firmly believed, knowing from whom he's learned it. How from childhood he's been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make him wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Those sacred writings are the Old Testament. Uh, the, the, the scriptures he's referring to are the Old Testament. Yeah. And all scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, training in righteousness. Why? Why? That the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And so if you delight yourself in the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, if you delight yourself in Genesis, you are going to find yourself equipped for every good work that we find in the needs of the church and in the glorification of Christ Jesus. Well, well said. I'd, I'd like to end on that. That's a really good explanation. Um, I know we're getting kind of pushed for time, but... I mean, that's, right. that's fine with me. Um, so... Um, we're going we're gonna to try and do this weekly, but yeah. Yeah. and hopefully we can catch up so you guys, actually, we're actually ahead of your reading plan, but that might take us a little while. I mean, you could tell we're, we're kind of figuring things out here. For those of us that are watching, yeah. Okay. Now, this may be put out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts. We'd love to have you guys um, have many options to listen or to watch. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you guys, uh, let's just finish out in a prayer. All right. Yeah. Um, you mind if I pray? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just, I feel like praying right now. Lord, thank you so much um, for the word that you've given us. God, thank you for um, for for revealing to us um, the, the the message of Genesis. God, that we have seen you and your glorious hand in creation, and your your loving kindness towards Abraham and Adam and Noah and and all of these people. God, I pray that we would um, that we would be men who would delight ourselves in your word, and that we would be faithful in applying what we read in our lives. Mm-hmm.